Long enough to cover the subject, short enough to keep it interesting. Welcome to Out of My League. I'm Nick Diaz. We will do sports quote of the week. Uh, Baltimore Ravens, why I just became a Baltimore Ravens fan, along with being a Saints fan, and movie review for Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. But first, we have a huge crisis on our hands. Newly crowned heavyweight boxing champion Andy Ruiz Jr., a.k.a. Fat Andy, is set for a rematch against the guy he beat for the title, Anthony Joshua. Now, quick backstory. Anthony Joshua who was the heavyweight title uh, champion, was like the biggest favorite in the history of Las Vegas, according to the Vegas bookies. And Andy Ruiz Jr., who has looks like an out-of-shape truck driver, beat the living crap out of him in the greatest upset in the history of boxing. Well, it came out this week that Andy Ruiz wants to lose weight for the next fight. Quote, I want to be more toned, end quote. Someone needs to stop this man immediately. Ruiz's nickname is Fat Andy, and they also call him Fat Boy. That is literally the greatest nickname in the history of sports. If you consider that he's a boxing champion, there are little fat kids sitting on the couch all across the world, and you want to take this away from them? So, Fat Andy, I'm I'm not even going to call him Andy Ruiz. I'm I'm just going to call him Fat Andy from here on out because I refuse to accept this. He he goes on to say, quote, I just want to shock the world even more, you know, end quote. I don't mean to sound racist, Fat Andy, but you're a fat Mexican man who beat the shit out of a ripped black dude. What more could you possibly do to shock the world? This is like a five foot nine white guy winning the NBA dunk contest when there's maximum participation. This will literally never happen again in the history of humanity. He goes on to say, Fat Andy, quote, I'll have more ability, more speed, more power if I turn that little flab I have into muscle, end quote. Uh, you don't know that, Fat Andy. Fat Andy talks about changing his diet, eating how he would eat a Snickers bar in between rounds when he would fight, and sometimes have Snicker bars at least three to four times a week, saying, quote, that's something I'm working on now, choosing the right foods, Fat Andy said. I'm not, if not, I would be eating three patty hamburgers with bacon and all kinds of cheese. Let me get this straight. You won the heavyweight championship of the world in the greatest upset in boxing history while eating four Snicker bars a week and putting extra cheese and bacon on your burger, and now you feel like you need to make your life better? Who is consulting Fat Andy? Yeah, I feel like this might be success just getting to his head. This is... This is so Someone needs to stop this. This is... Quote. He, he says, quote, I'm not trying to with six-pack abs and big muscles and all like that, but just look a little different, a little more lean. You realize, Fat Andy, you realize how many men across the world try every day to get a six-pack in order to impress women and fail miserably. And yet you, Fat Andy, you have been given the gift of being the Mexican-American version of Tony Soprano. Everyone talks about why the, uh, the TV show The Sopranos was so iconic. The writing, the acting, the stories, the family dynamic. But see, I, f- I figured this out. Tony Soprano was an ugly, fat guy, yet women couldn't keep their hands off him. That's why Tony Soprano is an American hero. And this guy's been given the gift of being the heavyweight boxing champion while just eating whatever the hell he wants. Tony Soprano would have ice cream every night before he went to bed. Fat Andy says, quote, How far I could go actually being in good shape and looking good, end quote. You can't, Fat Andy. You're the heavyweight champion of the world. You literally can't go any further. You literally cannot get any better. So listen, Fat Andy. When you go out there to fight next time, 
I don't care if it's just 10, 15 pounds lighter. I want cottage cheese all around that belly button. And if not for me, then do it for the fat kids, Fat Andy. Do it for the children. So I said earlier why I might become a Baltimore Ravens fan. So I was listening to Colin Cowherd the other day, and he had Peter Schrager on, for, for who's from the NFL Network. Peter Schrager said something that I had not heard before, and I'm surprised he's not getting more and more coverage. Uh, or maybe I'm just not paying close enough attention. The Ravens have quarterback Lamar Jackson, who is very much a run-first quarterback and is limited as a passer. And that was a criticism of him, of him in college. And that running first quarterbacks don't succeed long term in the NFL because they try to fit a square peg into a round hole with a passing offense. Well, what the Baltimore Ravens, according to Peter Schrager, and I looked this up from all different sources, what they're trying to do is go backwards in time with football offense because everybody's going forward. So if they go the dramatic opposite, teams might not know how to deal with it on a week-to-week basis. Peter Schrager said that the Baltimore Ravens will run the wing T and will have a wishbone formation. I think I just became a Baltimore Ravens fan. That that that's fantastic. Now it's going to be a fucking disaster, but oh my god, I just cannot wait to watch it. If you've ever seen old clips of the wing T or the wishbone, wing T is basically what they run in pee wee football and little bits in high school football. It's so much fun to watch, but it's going to be a disaster in the NFL. I applaud them for doing it. It may be exciting at first, but th- I, this is just going to be awesome. I just can't wait. So, uh, Saints, I'm still you're still my number one team, but. My second team is now the Baltimore Ravens. Go and wishbone. Bring it back, back that fullback. Sports quote of the week. We're going to do sports quote of the week is Jets rookie defensive tackle Quinnen Williams. Uh, he was the number three overall pick this past year in this past year's draft. <clears throat> and he was asked about his Madden video game rating by the press during uh, rookie mini camps. Not during, uh, during training camps, excuse me. Uh, He was asked about his uh, rating on the Madden video game, and and his response was, quote, I'm going to go play with myself today so I see how I feel. Oh, uh, that came out weird. Wrong, Quentin Williams. That came out the way God intended it to come out. Shouldn't apologize. It must be cool to, like, play on Madden. Like, play... like So when, when you're a kid... What we would mostly do is when we would have like NCAA football or Madden, we would create ourselves on the team in the game and give yourself like a 99 overall rating. Now everybody was either the running back or the quarterback. So those are the most fun fun positions to play. But I wonder how it feels like if you're a left tackle or a center or a defensive tackle in this case or a linebacker and somebody else is telling you how good you are and then you go on and play now you can edit how good you are on the thing once you buy the game but uh yeah go play with yourself Quentin Williams there's nothing wrong with playing with yourself movie review time so I went to go see like I said last week I said I was gonna go see Quentin Tarantino's new movie Once Upon a Time in Hollywood uh I saw it last Tuesday and I, full disclosure, I, I'm a huge Tarantino fan. There's only like two of his movies that I really love, though, and that's Pulp Fiction and Inglorious Bastards, which I also objectively believe, no coincidence, are his best two movies. Um, I went into this movie thinking I was going to dislike it because I had heard mixed reviews that it was long and boring. Now most of his movies, most of Tarantino's movies are long, but I heard that this was kind of a hangout movie, that this was not a movie like Django Unchained or even uh, Kill Bill. This was not an action movie. This was a hangout movie. There's not a heavy plot, uh, and so I kind of went in with a little, you know, 
a little cautious. Quentin Tarantino's Once Upon a Time in Hollywood visits 1969 Los Angeles, where everything is changing, as TV star Rick Dalton, played by Leonardo DiCaprio, and his longtime stunt double Cliff Booth, who is played by Brad Pitt, make their way around an industry they hardly recognize anymore. The ninth film from the writer-director features a large ensemble cast and multiple storylines in a tribute to the final moments of Hollywood's golden age. It also deals with backstories of Charles Manson and the Manson family. So, as far as the Manson family stuff is concerned, if you're going only for that, thinking it's going to be about the Manson family, as I, I just read, it's not. Uh, they're kind of like a side story. Having said that, you do know that that's going to be the end of the movie with the Manson families and what they did to Sharon Tate, who the actress that Margot Robbie plays. Uh, if you don't know, Sharon Tate was murdered by the Manson family back in 1969 and her friends that she was having a party with that night. And you go in to this movie knowing that this is looming over. So you see her, she's a very minor character in the film, although she's arguably the best thing in the movie, and you're following Leonardo DiCaprio and Brad Pitt weaving their way through, I think, what is it, like a two days? that You follow them for like a two-day period, two and a half, technically. And so when you're hanging out with them... I, I had this mindset of, okay, I know this is not a plot-heavy movie. This is just them hanging out, seeing their day-to-day -day life, kind of like a day-in-the-life sort of thing. And you, there are some really cool scenes that are in the trailer that if you watch, that are with like Bruce Lee and Brad Pitt. Uh, there's some acting scenes with Leo where he's on set acting that really, there's only... I went into this knowing that this was the Hangout movie, and I think because my expectations were so low and I prepared to at some point be bored, that I wasn't bored at all. There was only one 10-minute scene that I was bored. I'm like, okay, this could have been cut out or this could have been really trimmed down at least. But everything else, like, I just accepted what the movie was and I just embraced it. But what really kind of creates the tension, and there's some really like intense scenes in there. It's just oh, it takes a while to get to them. You know, the entire time there's this burden of waiting for those for the Manson family to just do this horrible act, and that kind of intensifies the movie. So it creates suspense, even when there's no suspense happening or meant to be played on film in the movie. When he's off, you know, in his acting trailer talking to the makeup person, as opposed to when Brad Pitt meets, you know, goes to the Manson family ranch, which is in the trailer. I'm not spoiling anything. It's really just shocking. Now, I'm not going to spoil anything else, uh, and I would avoid the internet at all costs, but this might be my third favorite Tarantino movie now, and I did not expect that going in. And most of the quibbles that critics have nowadays especially with this movie is well it's controversial or they thought it was sexist or this didn't really happen or that didn't really happen who you know this would never really happen with Bruce Lee and Brad Pitt that scene that they have together and blah 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 and they call it a controversial Quentin Tarantino movie well you don't have to call it controversial t Quentin Tarantino movie you just call it Quentin Tarantino movie. So if you're a normal person like me, you're not going to be offended by this at all. But if you know it going in that this is not a plot-heavy action movie, this is a hangout movie, kind of like Dazed and Confused or The Big Lebowski, except Big Lebowski is much shorter, so you don't feel the runtime. This movie's like three hours and 40 minutes long. Uh, I'm not going to lie. I, the end of this movie really made me emotional in a way that any Quentin Tarantino movie I never really thought would make me feel. And that shocked me. I didn't think he would make me feel almost even sentimental to a certain degree. But I give this a really high recommendation if you know what you're getting into before you get into it. So uh, thanks so much for listening.
uh, to out of my league, please like, share, and subscribe to the YouTube page. Uh, I'm Nick Diaz. See ya.